Welcome aboard to another English language A-level video with me Paul from the QE and this one is another video which helps us with meanings and representations and gets us ready for deconstructing linguistically the texts that you've got in the AQA paper one section A where you've got a current day text and uh, an older text and you have to evaluate the language devices that are going on. You know, incidentally it also gets you ready for your language investigation as well where you're going off and grabbing a whole load of data coming up with a question to ask of that data and then deconstructing the language. So let's start off with the idea of audience and the notion of audience address so audience address relates to the way that a writer or a speaker addresses the reader or a listener. And uh, what we're interested in is audience positioning. So audience positioning is the assumptions made in a text about the audience's background knowledge, their understanding, their attitudes and values to guide them towards an interpretation. So it's the idea that in skillful texts, uh, speakers or writers are going to be using language in carefully constructed ways in order to guide the uh, audience to respond in a certain way and that's audience positioning so the bit that's important in that is to guide them towards an interpretation it's not just a question of the text producer just using language to match the audience's assumptions it's trying to shape the audience's assumptions as well. So that's audience positioning. What better way to analyze a text than by looking at the beginning of a speech? And in this case, the, brill the very brilliant speech by the very brilliant JK Rowling. So here she is addressing Harvard. And I'm just gonna play the beginning of this and I want you to try and evaluate some of the linguistic techniques used by Rowling to address and position her audience. Here we go. President Faust, members of the Harvard Corporation and the Board of Overseers, members of the faculty, proud parents, and above all, graduates, the first thing I would like to say is thank you. Not only has Harvard given me an extraordinary honor, but the weeks of fear and nausea I have endured <laughs> at the thought of giving this commencement address have made me lose weight. <laughs> A win-win situation. Now all I have to do is take... Okay, right, so there you are, just the very beginning of that speech. And a classic hybrid text, blended mode text, where obviously she's, she's written it beforehand and here she is delivering it verbally. So evaluate the linguistic techniques used by Rowling to address and position her audience. Now, if you're in my class, you've got much more than that. You've got like the first three minutes of the speech, but let's just have a think. What would you hone in on, on a, the beginning of a speech like this? Well, you would look at the terms of address, either kind of names that Rowling uses to refer to people. Uh, is it their full name? Is it a honorific title that she gives? Is it a first name? Is it a nickname? And what does that say about her audience positioning? So terms of address means the names that uh, the text producer gives to people. Uh, politeness features. So this is this whole notion that Irving Goffman has about face and politeness. So to what extent have we got negative face and positive face strategies going on. When we're talking about positive face, we're talking about being complimentary and positive towards the other person, making them feel good. And when we're looking at negative face strategies, we're saying we're not imposing upon that other person. And we're often using quite indirect language uh, in order to uh, make them feel not uh, imposed upon. So that's politeness features. Humour, well, humour often works through the flouting of normal expectations. So to what extent does the speaker here uh, try and flout our normal expectations of what she might say? Uh, we also have pragmatic references where you could relate to schematic knowledge, uh, intertextuality, where speakers maybe make references to other 
texts and therefore there is an assumption being made about the cultural knowledge of the audience. And there is implicature, I implied readers, that the, the text receiver is supposed to infer. Uh, apply Yaus. In my previous video, we talked through uh, Martin Yaus's five levels of formality. So what levels of formality do we have here? And do we have contrasts going on? And what effect is created by those contrasts? Humour, for example. And also think about the organisation of ideas and how the talk is structured and the kind of cohesive devices that, uh, that glue together the different parts of the text. So there she is, and there's the opening where she says, President Frost, members of the Harvard Corporation and the Board of Overseers, members of the faculty, proud parents, and above all, graduates. The first thing I would have to say is thank you. So in terms of terms of address here, we have very lengthy titles being given. So these are the honorific titles. It shows that she is showing respect. So she's using quite indirect language at the beginning there. You could call this negative face in order to give the full titles of these important people and important organizations. So she foregrounds everything that she says by addressing people in that way. And notice that last of all, she puts graduates, but in order to show that actually she wants to show the highest level of respect to them, she uses this adverbial above all. Okay. And what's interesting is that the most, semantically, the most important uh, words in that first sentence are the final two. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of the syntactical structure, it's interesting that she's put that right at the end of the sentence in order to give it a kind of rhetorical weight. Not only has Harvard given me an extraordinary honour, but the weeks of fear and nausea I have endured at the thought of giving this commencement address have made me lose weight. A win-win situation. So we start off with quite this formal register don't we? We've, we've got polysyllabic lexis being used. Uh, and, then, and then suddenly we come on to fear and nausea. And so we've got this overturning of expectations because she's gone from somebody saying nice things to somebody who's really talking about like horrible experiences. So you've got that comic contrast going on there. And as the sentence goes on, then the uh, register diminishes that we get a lower level of register have made me lose weight so you've got the monosyllabic words there and then you've got a single minor sentence with just three words and the very colloquial use of that kind of piece of jargon a win-win situation which she's ironically using it's kind of like business jargon okay so what's interesting here is how funny she is you know she's a funny speaker and therefore she's positioning her audience as people who will be appreciative of humor. Okay, so um, here in the textbook on page 68, uh, there is another text in which you can talk about audience positioning and you can talk about it through the idea of synthetic personalization. Synthetic personalization is explained on page 66 in the textbook the person who's responsible for coining this noun phrase is the linguist Norman Fairclough, and he defines synthetic personalization as the simulation of private face-to-face, person-to-person discourse in public mass audience discourse, print, radio, television. So simulation suggests that in using synthetic personalization, the text is just imitating the effect of someone addressing you personally face-to-face, person-to-person. And we're getting this all the time in advertisements, aren't we? So although they're written texts, they're taking on, they're imitating some of the features of everyday kind of conversational discourse in order to achieve this synthetic personalization. So if you have the textbook, turn to page 68 and look at this uh, shampoo advertisement, which says, got what it takes to get three yeses? You may or you may not be the star of the future, but now that Herbal Essences have brought back four of your favourite classic collections, you'll always dazzle. Four fab fragrances in the much-loved original bottles. We call them Herbal's Greatest Hits. 
Say yes to naturally irresistible hair. Now, this is a product that I always use because I have naturally irresistible hair. And if we were analyzing this in terms of language, we could be looking at these sorts of things. So look at sentence function. Have we just got uh, declaratives here? Not at all. Look, we've got an uh, interrogative being posed to us at the very beginning. Got what it takes to get three yeses. So we're being asked a question. And when we read that question, we may be a bit flummoxed. So it might take us a little bit of time to understand the pragmatics behind it. OK, so we've got interrogatives being used. Uh, we've also got an imperative being used at the end there. Say yes to naturally irresistible hair. So those two features, the interrogative and the imperative, are kind of positioning us as somebody who is listening to them having a conversation synthetic personalization. Pronoun usage is very important here, isn't it? We have the heavy use of the second person pronoun, you or your, you may or may not be, your favorite, you'll always dazzle. So the use of the second person pronoun there kind of suggests that we are in some kind of relationship and that they, the text producers, know about us and our assumptions, synthetic personalization. Look at the use of modal auxiliary verbs. If there are modal auxiliary verbs in text, they're always worth pointing out. So you may or may not be the star of the future. So it's using epistemic modal auxiliary verbs in the beginning there to say, look, you might think of yourself as somebody who's going to be a star or maybe not. So it's kind of positioning you as somebody that, you know, they're thinking about you as the text re receiver. And, but look at this, you've got uh, elision here with you'll, which would be you will. So the will there would be a more forceful modal auxiliary verbs with a higher level of certainty. So what it's trying to show you is that they are very, very certain that if you use this product, you are going to, in their words, dazzle. So that's to do with your modal auxiliary verbs. You've then got these pre-modifying adjectives and adverbs, I modifiers, which are very important, obviously, in any kind of advertising discourse. I'm talking about, you know, fab, for example, where you've got clipping going on. You've got a clipped form. It's a slightly old fashioned, actually, form, which I would associate with a kind of older person's discourse. I don't hear that many younger people actually using that anymore, fab. So if you were to collect together some of the pre-modified adjectives that you've got here, you've got the word favorite, you've got classic, you've got fab, you've got much loved, you've got original. All of these are very subjective. For example, this compound uh, adjective, much loved. One asks the question, how do you know they're loved, right? Who loves them? OK, so it's full of assumptions that are being made in order to get you on board. And then the final sort of modifying section is here in here where it says naturally irresistible, where we've got a play on words with natural, because obviously it literally means that the ingredients that they've got are natural, but it's also being used as a kind of adverbial as well, naturally. OK, so the adjectives and the adverbs are playing an important part in this we have uh, elliptical constructions got what it takes to get three yeses instead of have you got what it takes so the omission of the primary auxiliary verb have and the omission of the second person pronoun makes this an elliptical construction and therefore creates the illusion that somebody is actually talking and having a chat with you You've got Yaus's level of formality. So you bundle everything that we've said so far together and you would say, well, what have we got here? We've got kind of consultative bordering on the casual level of formality. OK, and then we've got pragmatics making a big um, <clears throat> meaning onto this. So obviously you have to know a little bit about reality tv programs where people are doing auditions in front of judges like the x factor and those judges are giving them yeses and noes so there's kind of implied knowledge there there's essential schematic knowledge that you'd have to know in order to fully get this idea and that sort of ties in with this idea of greatest hits that it's talking about the shampoo kind of using the world of celebrity and uh, popular music and culture. 
Okay, so lots of techniques being used in a very short advertisement there to achieve synthetic personalization. Okay, now let's move on to cohesion. So cohesion is about how texts work together in terms of structure, how all the little bits of a text, excuse me, my lights have gone off. So this is about how the, the different parts of a text kind of hang together. I'm gonna to give you seven paragraphs from a news article. And what I want you to do is to rearrange them so that they make sense. Here we go. Okay, so stop the video there and rearrange them so that they are in what you think the correct order. Okay, I'm assuming that you've done that. Now let's have a talk through the actual answers on this then. So we start off with this uh, arresting headline, repulsive and riveting with a bit of consonants at the beginning there. And they're almost like antonyms, aren't they? They're kind of opposites. It's a juxtaposition of two, two different ideas in these adjectives, repulsive and riveting. We start off with, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, last November, I watched Takaru Kobayashi devour a record 97 hamburgers with buns, onions and mustard in eight minutes flat, one every seven, five seconds. It was a repulsive, riveting and astounding feat. Okay, so this is your opening orientation, it's called. So it gives us the basic details of where is this happening? When is this happening? Who is involved? And what's going on? Okay, so this is your orientation. And the expectation is that newspaper articles will tend to do that. Okay, their, their structure is different, say, to a piece of narrative fiction where you wouldn't expect all of the major events of the story to be summarised in your first sentence. So there's your orientation with lots of adverbials, adverbials of place, of time, of manner, etc. And the end of that paragraph goes, it was a repulsive, riveting and astounding feat. So you've got the link between the adjectives being used at the end of that first paragraph and the adjectives obviously being used there in the headline. Okay. And it makes us think why this person was eating that enormous amount of food. Okay, which then takes us into this. Participants in the annual World Hamburger Eating Championships had sought to persuade me that competitive eating was a sport requiring extraordinary physical ability and mental toughness. Okay, so we get the explanation here about why Takaru Kobayashi is eating all of this food. He's a participant in the annual World Hamburger Eating Championships. So it's giving us more information about the actual event. And it's also giving us clues about the journalist as well and the journalist's initial scepticism, where initially the journalist going along couldn't really imagine that eating could be considered to be a sport. That's the idea of the scepticism of the journalist is then stated there at the beginning of the third paragraph. I was deeply sceptical until I watched the baby-faced wisp from Japan in action. The 13 gurgitators lined up. The MC counted down. They were off. A blur of flying hands, bobbing hands and gaping gullets. Notice how groups of three are a rhetorical device which a journalist use here. We've got a couple of groups of three here, haven't we? We've got the action of lining up, counting down, and then they were off. And then we've got the physical description of those three things there. So it's a triplet, it's a list of three, it's a common rhetorical technique. There's lots of humour being used here. For example, the description of one of the competitors being called baby-faced when clearly they must be quite enormous. So there's a use of irony and humour. So then we go through the actual chronology of what happens in this competition, Mr. Kobayashi. And notice we've got kind of variation in the term of address here. He's been called Takaru Kobayashi here. So in order to make things slightly different, we've got his honorific title, Mr. Kobayashi, wetted each burger before it's stuffing it into his mouth. After two minutes, he had consumed 23. 
leading Joey Chestnut, America's Great Hope, by one. So we're kind of being taken into the competition now, step by step, and we're being told what's happened after two minutes. And again, we've got ironic humour being used. The uh, description of Joey Chestnut here in this adverbial expression, America's Great Hope, is humorous because I wonder about how many Americans actually know or care about Joey Chestnut's feats. We then move forward in time chronologically within five minutes. So we've got an adverbial time there. Both had smashed the previous record of 69 and the 3,000 spectators were roaring. So the descriptions about the crowd there shows the kind of enthusiasm of the audience in watching this event. I felt sure they would vomit, but they kept going. Each bun a triumph of mind <laughs> over a rebellious body. Lots of humour again. Comic juxtapositions, you know, talking about buns and then using these rather that rather lofty uh, polysyllabic, well, is it polysyllabic? Polysyllabic abstract noun triumph. Okay. And then finally, so the we've got an adverbial hair that signals that this is the end of the article. The buzzer sounded. Mr. Chestnut had devoured 19, 91, 21 more than the world record, but six fewer than Mr. Kobayashi. Awesome, muttered my neighbour. And that kind of resolves the story in a humorous way, doesn't it? Because you're left wondering, well, if I were there, uh, you know, looking at this situation, would I describe this event as being awesome or just repulsive? OK, so what we've done there is we've taken you through that article because I wanted to really give you this idea of cohesion, that a, a, a text can only really succeed if the bits of the text are linked together. And that's called cohesion. And the bits that link the things together, they are called cohesive devices. So cohesive devices are the linguistic techniques that connect together parts of a text and they're pretty important in terms of discourse it's a question of you standing back from a text and looking at the patterns that are going across and the kind of language that glues together bits together so that's called cohesion okay so thank you very much for that and we'll call it a day there